So good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my real pleasure to co-chair this session de uh, debate uh, from um, controversy in diagnostic imaging in coronary artery disease. Uh, my co-chair is Professor Dr. Manuel Pan. He's a very well-known interventional cardiologist from Cordoba in Spain. Me, I'm Francisco Calvo from Vigo. I'm clinical cardiologist devoted to cardiac imaging too. And it's a real pleasure to have very well-known contenders in this field. I think they are well appropriate and were especially chosen for this for this topic uh, debate. Uh, first one from the uh, non-invasive side of the uh, cardiology imaging, uh, we have the Professor Stefan Achenbach. Uh, Professor Stefan Achenbach is coming from Erlangen in Germany. And well, when he started uh, studying in the university, I think he uh, he w preferred to go physics, to uh, work, move to, uh, to physics. But finally, he he moved to to medicine. And after finishing medicine, I thought. Uh, he intended to be a cardiac surgeon, but finally, finally, I think uh, 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 we have the opportunity to, to listen for him uh, talking about the um, non-invasive uh, diagnosis of coronary artery disease. He's one of the leading experts in the world. He has published a lot of papers, even uh, New England Journal of Medicine, as you know, and of course, he's the leading expert in the clinical, uh, clinical trials on registries as the confirmed registry. Uh, on the other side, uh, from the invasive uh, side of the uh, diagnosis, uh, we have uh, the professor Justin Davis. Justin Davis is coming from London. He's uh, now working at the Hammersmith Hospital uh, that's related to the Imperial College University. So um, he's uh, devoted mainly to the mathematical and physical modeling of the uh, circulation and the arterial pressure. His work is very well known in the in the field of uh, our arterial hypertension. You can remind the ASCOT study, for instance. And nowadays, he's involved in one uh, very important and uh, attractive uh, way of measuring uh, physiology of the coronary artery circulation, that is the concept of IFR, that is uh, remarkably studied in the advice uh, trial. So it's a real pressure. and. Um, to, to discuss this, this session, and we have scheduled it in this way, 20 minutes uh, lecture each of the presenters, and after that, very short reply, three to five minutes each one. So let's move, Professor Ahema, when you want. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to speak to you about the topic that was given to me, coronary CT angiography is ready, to, in place, to replace invasive angiography. Let's start with CT imaging in general. The technology of CT has developed tremendously during the past decade. It is now an imaging method that provides very high temporal resolution and also very high and isotropic spatial resolution, which means that the spatial resolution is the same in any orientation of the data set. And this gives us the opportunity to use CT for very high resolution imaging of the heart. Here you can see a ventricular septal defect. Not only static, but also dynamic um, images of the heart can be acquired. And probably CT is the imaging technique that has the highest temporal and spatial resolution of all the imaging techniques that are available to us um, and can be used um, for general cardiac imaging. There are not many instances when we need CT imaging for general morphology and function, but sometimes there is a need to use it when other imaging modalities fail. Um, here, for example, um, is a case of a bioprosthetic pulmonary valve that just could not be imaged by any method, neither echocardiography nor MR. And so this would be one of the very infrequent cases when we resort to CT imaging for morphology and functional imaging of the heart. And this is just a demonstration of what CT can do as far as general imaging is concerned. It's something that can be used when other imaging modalities fail, while typically we don't need it for general cardiac imaging. This is different when we look at the coronary arteries because other non-invasive technology cannot visualize the coronary vessels because 
Other imaging modalities do not have sufficient temporal or spatial resolution. But CT has become very stable in visualizing the coronary lumen. Here's one example. After contrast injection, you can see a high-grade stenosis of the right coronary artery. And in comparison, you can see the invasive angiogram um, on the other side. There are some prerequisites to use CT for coronary imaging. Of course, you have to have adequate equipment. Currently, at least 64 slice CT is required or recommended to use for cardiac and coronary imaging. Patients need to be somewhat selected. Patients should have sinus rhythm. Some experts use CT also in patients who have atrial fibrillation, but it's very difficult and image quality is not consistent. So in general, patients should be in sinus rhythm. They have to be able to hold their breath for approximately 10 seconds. They should not have excessive body weight. More than, I would say, 100, 130 to 140 kilograms is problematic. Everything below 120 kilograms is really not problematic at all. Patients need to be prepared for a CT study of the coronary arteries. They should give, get nitrates, and it's also um, almost mandatory to reduce the heart rate, if in any way possible, to less than 60 beats per minute. Contrast agent needs to be injected somewhere between 50 and 80 milliliters of contrast, and of course there is radiation exposure. I'll talk about this in a little more detail in a second, but it's somewhere in the range of 1 to 15 millisieverts. So there are some prerequisites for CT imaging of the coronary arteries. It cannot be done in everybody, um, um, but uh, some of these um, issues need to be considered. Here's another example where you can see an invasive angiogram, and then you can see the CT angiogram showing the high-grade stenosis of the osteal LAD um, in comparison to the invasive angiogram. As I said, the minimum prerequisite at the moment to do CT imaging of the coronary arteries is to have a 64-slice CT scanner, which gives a temporal resolution of approximately 250 milliseconds and requires about four to six heartbeats to cover the volume of the heart. But of course, technology is progressing. We now have better, more modern scanners. There are those scanners that have more slices, not just 64 slices, but 256 or 320 slices. And what they achieve is that they don't need four to six heartbeats to cover the volume of the heart. They can do it in one or two heartbeats. So the overall acquisition time is longer. And then there's another technical development which is the dual source CT. It's not about adding more slices, but it's combining two tubes and two detectors in one gantry, and this improves the temporal resolution. And with the most modern dual source CT scanners, the temporal resolution is 60 milliseconds per image. So this is tremendously better than the 64 slice scanners used to have that had 250 milliseconds temporal resolution per image. A lot has also been done about radiation dose, which I said um, can be somewhere in the range of 1 to 15 millisieverts. In the early days of CT and geography, it was even more. Um, but there are now many methods, for example, changing the acquisition mode, changing the tube current, changing the tube voltage um, to reduce radiation exposure. And here you can see um, examples of substantially lower radiation exposure, 0.8 millisieverts. Um, for this uh, CT angiogram, um, and in some very selected cases, even much lower doses, such as 0 0.3 millisieverts are possible in this case. But this is not for everybody, especially when body weight goes up, you cannot use these very, very low dose protocols. So what are realistic radiation exposures today? This is the standard protocol that we use for our patients in our institution, it's uh, for those of you who do cardiac CT, we use 90 kV, 450 MAS, and a prospectively triggered scan. And the dose for these protocols is 1.4 millisieverts. And this is the image quality that you get. Again, you can see another high-grade osteal LAD stenosis. And this, in comparison, is the invasive angiogram. Just to give you a reference, 1.4 millisieverts effective dose for this CT protocol. For invasive angiography, typically the dose is somewhere in the 2 to 5 millisievert range, uh, approximately 2 to 5 millisieverts. In the German cardiac CT registry, where 13 sites entered their data, um, and a total of 5,000 CT angiography examinations were, um, were combined, which is already four years ago, 
the average dose was 3.6 millisieverts. So you can see that the radiation exposure really is now approximately in the range of an invasive angiogram, very roughly. Um, it can be lower in some patients, it can be higher in some patients, but it's in the same um, range as invasive angiography is. Here's another example of a high-grade LED stenosis in CT and invasive angiography. What is the accuracy of CT to identify stenosis? How reliable is CT? Here's a meta-analysis of 30 trials. And you can see that the sensitivity is very high, 95.6% sensitivity to detect stenosis in comparison to invasive angiography. The specificity is not quite as high. It's about 81%, 82%, the specificity, so there are some false positive findings. But the sensitivity, more than 95%, very high sensitivity to identify coronary stenosis. And since sensitivity is high, the negative predictive value is very high, which turns into what we call a high negative likelihood ratio. The negative likelihood ratio is 0.022. This means that if you suspect coronary artery disease in a given patient and you do a CT and the CT is normal, then the likelihood that the patient has coronary artery stenosis is 50 times lower than if you had not done the CT. So it lowers the likelihood by a factor of 50 when you have a negative CT in a patient with suspected coronary artery disease. And this high negative likelihood ratio means that a normal CT is extremely reliable to rule out coronary artery stenosis. If you see a normal CT, you know that the patient has no disease and needs no further testing. Because of this high reliability of CT, especially to rule out stenosis, it has been incorporated in a number of European guidelines. The guidelines on management of stable coronary disease give a class 2A recommendation in patients with suspected coronary artery disease and low pretest likelihood. The guidelines on revascularization reiterate the class 2A recommendation. And then also the very recent guidelines on non ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. Patients with acute chest pain also give a class 2A recommendation. It should be considered in individuals who come with acute chest pain but have a low likelihood of having coronary artery disease. So, taking a step back, CT angiography can be regarded as an option to rule out coronary artery stenosis in suitable patients. For example, they should not be in atrial fibrillation and they should not be too heavy. And clinical situations, for example, the patient who has low pretest likelihood of disease. It has reasonable radiation dose because that's often a point of criticism, but it's really no longer valid. It's very reliable to exclude stenosis, and which means that if a CT is normal, no further testing is needed. Now, are there some problems and limitations? I'm sure that my opponent will, you know, raise some of the problems and limitations, but of course we have to acknowledge that CT, like any other test, has specific limitations. The number one limitation of CT is that it really requires optimal image quality to be clinically useful. When a CT is not performed well, when it has lots of artifact, motion artifact, for example, high noise and a lot of classification, it becomes unreliable. Uh, false positive results are typically the consequence when a CT test is not done with very high image quality. Uh, here's an example of a patient who had a CT done elsewhere. It was actually an orthopedic surgeon who had a CT performed and the report written by a radiologist, by the way, said there was a suspicion of at least 50% LAD stenosis. But then if you look at the images, you can clearly see that they're simply non-diagnostic. They are full of motion artifacts, so you cannot say anything. The CT quality was simply too bad. So this patient came to our site and we sat down with the patient and we said, you know, let's do the CT again and do it right. And then we did the CT again and this is the same patient with a carefully performed CT, and you can, see, can clearly see that everything is absolutely normal. So poor image quality is a problem of CT angiography, as with any other test. If you have poor image quality in MR, echo, or nuclear medicine, you have the very same problems. So we really need high-end scanners to perform cardiac CT. Patients have to be prepared and you have to have expertise in doing and reading the test. And, and then, in many, even in very difficult situations like this heavy calcified artery, you can still reliably rule out corneal stenosis if image quality is good. The second, I wouldn't even call it problem of CT, it's an issue that needs to be considered, is the fact that CT shows stenosis, but it does not show ischemia. Like 
invasive angiography, which shows stenosis, but not necessarily ischemia. You have to keep this in mind when you do clinical decision making. If you see a very high grade left main stenosis, you know that this stenosis is relevant even when you have no ischemia test to show that there's ischemia. And this holds true for CT, and this is the same invasive angiogram. Um, so there are some situations where anatomy is enough. In many other situations, however, you see a lesion, but there's not certain whether this lesion actually causes ischemia. And I'm sure Dr. Davies will talk about this a lot. So just by CT alone, you cannot determine whether a lesion that you see has a consequence as far as ischemia is concerned. But again, this is not a problem that is a problem only of CT. It's exactly the same problem of invasive angiography. When you see a stenosis, you do not necessarily know whether the stenosis causes ischemia. <clears throat> there are some attempts to use CT also to identify ischemia. For example, you can do virtual FFR, which is a simulation of the FFR based on CT anatomy. And it's also possible to do CT perfusion imaging. But these are still, I would call them, in clinical validation. These are not clinical tools at the moment. They are something for the future, but not something that we use currently. But currently what you do, when you have a CT with a stenosis and it's unclear whether the stenosis is, is, causes ischemia, clinical, further clinical decision making, either you have to go to non-invasive stress testing or you go to invasive angiography plus FFR and then you can find out whether a lesion has ischemic potential. A third frequent criticism of CT is that it's often used for screening purposes because it's so attractive the ability to visualize coronary artery anatomy non-invasively is so tempting that it's often used as a screening tool in patients who have very, very few symptoms or maybe no symptoms at all. And then, of course, there's criticism because often the clinical consequences of these screening tests are not very good. Either what is really only plaque is misinterpreted as a high-grade stenosis and then unnecessary further testing will result. Or there's bad image quality, as I showed before, which then causes further testing, which was not really necessary, or really irrelevant findings like a stenosis of a very small side branch then trigger further um, invasive investigation. And, but this is not a problem of CT. Um, this is a problem of those who use CT and interpret the uh, findings incorrectly and should really not be held against CT. But it's, it's something that needs to be taken into, con into consideration. Simply because it's possible, it does not mean that we should put the threshold for using CT and geography too low. So coronary CTA has some limitations. I would be the first to acknowledge that. There is exposure to radiation, even though that exposure is not very high. It cannot be used in everyone. Image quality must be good in order to be clinically useful. Poor image quality is really very bad because it leads to incorrect consequences of a scan. CT cannot show ischemia, which is a limitation that it shares with invasive angiography. There's a temptation to use it for screening purposes, which should not be done. Also, other issues like stents can be problematic. CT is not really reliable in patients who have implanted coronary stents. Here you can see a very nice example, but also a poor example where stents causes artifacts. So we cannot use it for every patient, but this does not mean that it's not clinically useful in those patients where it makes a lot of sense. But we have to keep in mind that CT is extremely reliable to rule out stenosis um, and that we should use it in that way. There's very good prognostic data showing that there is an event rate close to zero if patients are symptomatic but they have a normal CT scan. Very large clinical trials have shown this over and over again. You can rely on the negative CT. If the CT shows no stenosis, there is no need for further diagnostic workup. There is no need for therapy. And there's very, very large bodies of data. Here, for example, 25,000 patients, no, 23,000 patients followed for three years showing that the event rate is extremely low if CT and geography is normal. A test like this is urgently needed, a test that can rule out coronary artery disease non-invasively, because you all know this data very well. This is a registry of invasive angiograms, where 400,000 patients who received invasive angiography were included, and only 38% of those who went to invasive angiography had obstructive coronary artery disease. 
So more than 60% did not have obstructive coronary artery disease. So there's clearly a need for better non-invasive testing to prevent these unnecessary invasive angiograms. Even those who had ischemia testing and a positive ischemia test, only 41% of them had invasive angiography stenosis. So we need a tool that avoids these 60% of invasive angiograms that show no stenosis. And CT has the potential to be this test. CT, first of all, is safe. If the CT is normal, nothing will happen to the patient. This was confirmed again by the recent randomized 10,000 patient trial, which is called the PROMISE trial. And in this trial, once again, you could see that in patients who had a CT and went to invasive angiography, only 28% of them had coronary artery angiography without um, coronary artery stenosis, while in those who had functional testing, ischemia testing, 50% of cats showed no coronary artery stenosis. So CT really has the potential to avoid these unnecessary invasive angiograms that show no coronary artery stenosis. Another trial that shows this was the randomized platform study, which was just published in the European Heart Journal. 380 patients who were planned for invasive angiography, half of them went to invasive angiography, and half of them had CT first. And the number of invasive angiographies without obstructive stenosis could be reduced from 73% if no CT was done to 12% if CT was done. So it's really a method to avoid these invasive angiograms that show no stenosis. It's a fantastic tool to be used in suitable patients to rule out coronary artery disease when the pretest likelihood of coronary artery stenosis is low and to avoid negative angiograms, meaning, in, meaning invasive angiograms without stenosis. In some way, it can even provide useful information for PCI. This is a patient who had a very high-grade, long LED stenosis, but absolutely no calcification. This was also seen in invasive angiogram. And then if there's no calcium, you know that this is a good candidate, for example, for bioresorbable vascular scaffold, so it can help you for decision-making in planning your PCI intervention. For some reason that I don't fully understand, there is two camps of cardiologists. There are some enthusiasts that would really strongly support the use of CT angiography, and then there are those who are almost dogmatically against cardiac CT, the fierce opponents, which is also something that is probably not very reasonable. I think we just have to be reasonable and recognize that can coronary CTI replace invasive angiography? Certainly not completely. CTA cannot be performed in every patient, and clinically it does not make sense in every patient, but it's a very good option to replace a significant number of invasive angiograms, especially when stenosis are unlikely, and it helps us to avoid negative catheterization, which in low-risk patients, and if CT is available, um, should no longer be re um, regarded as a technique of choice to rule out coronary artery stenosis invasively when we can do it just as well non-invasively by CT. Thank you very much for your attention. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Achenbach. So, let's move with Dr. Davis, the, the next speaker. It has been a very, very interesting lecture. You have been very elegant and also prudent. So. Great. Well, morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to come to your wonderful country and to spend some time here in Malaga. Um, I'm sure you all agree that that was a fantastic talk. I don't think I've ever seen so many beautiful uh, CT images and a, a very, very balanced uh, talk. I think one of the things I've learned over the last few years is that nothing is perfect in clinical medicine. Nothing is really perfect in science, and uh, I think that we had a really very balanced talk there whereby some tests are used in some certain circumstances and others in, in others. I'm going to show you, uh, as, as was suggested by the previous speaker, some areas where I think there are differences and I really believe probably that actually these two, two technologies can't really exist uh, outside of uh, each other. So let me try and move ahead here. So that's me, a conflict of interest statement. So I, th I think we need to just take a few steps back when we think about where we use these different modalities. And to some extent, I think that most of us would probably agree that certain circumstances, we're not going to 
be doing uh, CT scans and other circumstances we, we may well be doing them. So for instance, if someone comes in with an acute myocardial infarction, massive anterior ST elevation, you're just going to take them straight to the cath lab and they're almost all circumstances going to get an invasive angiogram. And in most cases, it's the same with a, a, an acute coronary syndrome as well. When there's significant evidence, there may be a ruptured plaque which needs treatment. And the reason being, of course, is that you can take them into the lab, have the treatment, and things are done. Where there's more uh, question, of course, is where you, where you have stable coronary disease, which is really what we've been talking about, or in many of the cases we've been talking about people who don't really have coronary disease at all, have random chest pains that we see in our clinics day in, day out, and of course, in many of those cases, there are different options which may be appropriate, maybe an imaging modality, maybe a, a, a stress test of some kind as well. So certainly I think there's more debate there. What I think is important with regards to treatment of stable disease, and of course this is a, a very, very big issue, and many studies are underway looking at the benefits of revascularization in its entirety with stable disease, is why do we actually stent? Why do we, why do we try and fix, whether it's with stents or with uh, coronary artery bypass grafts, uh, stable coronary disease? And the one thing we you know, absolutely know for certain is that in patients who truly have blocked or narrowed coronary artery disease, they have decreased flow, and so ideally we want to increase that blood flow, get more blood, oxygen, nutrients to the heart muscle, to reduce ischemia, and most importantly for our patients, to relieve angina. That's the reason. And I'll show you why this is important here from a, a very simple study which basically looked at blood flow in coronary arteries and it shows essentially the more severe the blockage, the better the improvement in flow after stenting. So the first pair you'll see is before and after stenting. And these are all people who had a very significant narrowing in the artery with an FFR was less than 0.6. And you can see if you stent or revascularize these patients, you have a threefold increase in blood flow. So just think what a difference that would make to your patient. Increased blood flow by three times. As this stenosis becomes physiologically less significant, you see that this step up becomes less. So there's still a benefit with this FFR between 0.6 and 0.7, but it's smaller. And as you progress up and you get to more and more moderate and then more mild lesions, you see that this benefit of actually revascularizing starts to disappear. The problem we have, and I'll discuss this in more detail now, is that identifying whether an artery is significant or, and could benefit from a stent or benefit from a bypass graft or not really is almost impossible to do from just looking at an angiogram or a CT scan. Unless, of course, you've got an artery which is completely smooth and regular, where, as we've heard, and I completely agree, in almost all cases will be physiologically negative and, and there's no real benefit of revascularizing a <coughs> patient. But if you take this case here, this is uh, from uh, Javier Scanard here, uh, you see there's a diffuse disease in this right coronary artery with a more focal lesion in the mid vessel. He put this pressure wire down here and found that the lesion in this case was significant with an FFR of 0.75 falling on an ischemic threshold. So in this case, you've seen from those charts I showed you previously, it's likely that there'll be an improvement in blood flow. Here's another case, and I just want to point out to you, uh, there's a, a very tight narrowing in, in a diagonal branch, which you can just about see uh, coming in here. This is part of the uh, Syntex 2 study. Here's the diagonal here. And in this study, we need to measure with a pressure wire before we put any stents in. And we only put stents into arteries which have a physiologically significant lesion. And the benefits here, of course, are that we reduce angioplasty to only the arteries which actually benefit from uh, the revascularization. We have to revascularize everything which is significant. The reason I'm showing you this is it's very, very difficult to, to guess from the angiogram or from a CT what's significant or not. So in this live case we did here, you see David Kanzori, myself, Iqbal Malik. David positions the wire into this diagonal branch and then essentially looks at the physiology is it worth treating this as a small branch? Could cause more problems uh, than we actually solve. But you see immediately when this wire goes down there, it's highly significant with these values, in this case of IFR, being around 0.5. So this very, very significant artery suggests that there'll be significant ischemia and significant benefit for the patient. 
So I think things are a little bit more complicated than just looking at an angiogram, just looking at a CT scan to try and identify what we should be treating or not. You can certainly see that a value of 0 0.05, whether it's an FFR or IFR, is very significant. It's highly likely there's ischemia. And most important for our patients is that if you treat people with values which are very significant, there's likely to be a big improvement in blood flow. So this is really, really important for us always to, to, to uh, remember. And we must get away from trying to be very visually focused uh, these angiogram or CT or any other imaging modality uh, we may have in mind. We know the evidence here is strong in terms of hard clinical outcomes. You've seen many of these studies. I'm sure you've all seen the FAME study which showed the potential benefits in terms of hard clinical endpoints with regards to using a physiology-based approach over just angiography alone. And what I mean angiography here, it could be angiogram, it could be a CT scan, and essentially my point I'm making is that we need to expand beyond just the, the uh, image itself and actually consider what's going on within the artery. Other studies such as FAME2 went on to, to further demonstrate this. And again, you can see in this higher risk group of patients, again, there's very, very significant uh, differences between the uh, group which uh, received PCI with a, a physiological guidance and those who just received medical therapy who had physiologically significant lesions. So when you see images like this, and they're beautiful images, and we saw even more beautiful images than this uh, in the previous talk, and we have conclusions made, in this case here, that it's a non-obstructive plaque from a proximal LED. No further imaging is required. I think we need to be careful, because I think that obviously there are limitations, and we've heard a very honest discussion of, of when CT can be problematic, with regards to a lot of calcium or atrial fibrillation and so on. But a perhaps an even bigger question is whether a lesion actually is worthy of significance and worthy of revascularization. This chart here from uh, Pimtonino uh, demonstrates this very nicely, where you see at the bottom of the, of the figure the angiogram stenosis severity, and on the y-axis there the fractional flow reserve value. And you can see a few things. You can see a general trend. As the stenosis becomes more significant, so you see that the FFR value drops as well. So these are very significant lesions, and these are less significant lesions angiographically, and you can see that there's a general slope here. But one thing you'll also see from these uh, charts here is you'll see even with these very significant lesions, although the majority of the values have physiology which is positive, some have physiology which is very normal. And as you become more mild, you see this further uh, increases. So there's even more lesions here which have normal physiology and even more in the more mild group as well. So making these definitive diagnostic statements about whether something needs treatment or doesn't, I think we need to be very, very cautious. And perhaps a nice study or a series of studies, there's now been three of them which looked at this, the first of which came from Eric Van Vell as part of the French National Registry, the R3F study, essentially looked to see how good we were at looking at angiogram images and then knowing whether the artery would truly benefit from revascularization based on the actual FFR in that value. So they systematically measured FFR in each of the arteries and then saw how closely they matched to what they thought would happen. So in this case here you can see just the, the cardiologist looking at the images. They said 50% of patients should just get medical therapy. 37 should have PCI and 11 bypass. Now when you actually apply the physiology to this, what happens? Well you can see that from the optimal medical therapy group, 13% would benefit from PCI and 4% believe it or not would go into the, the cabbage arm. And you can see similar changes to all these groups. So with the PCI group, some go to bypass, some go to medical therapy. Cabbage, much the same. You have these same movements. So overall, the numbers of patients in both these groups in the different segments remains about the same, but there's a huge degree of switching of categories between patients. So around 43% here. Another study performed uh, by Portuguese colleagues showed very, very similar findings. So you see they came out with a, a, a value of around about 44%. So decision-making was changed in about 44% of cases when they considered the physiology. 
UK study, slightly smaller study in this case, found a, a very, well, it's a slightly lower number, but essentially it's on that same kind of scale, showing essentially that when you use the physiology, it, it really does change the decision-making uh, patterns. And perhaps most worryingly for all of us who like to look at angiogram images and make decisions on the basis of these for our patients, so when you disregard the physiology, it can lead to quite catastrophic consequences. So here you can see, in these cases here, when the physicians, in this case it's the R3F French registry, disregarded the FFR. So the FFR was negative, the FFR was positive, they just ignored it. And in these groups here, they actually followed it and you can see that there's a massive decrease here in the, in the survival uh, in terms of these kaplan meier curves. So there's a very, very big difference here in terms of following or, or uh, ignoring the, the physiology. So I think that we need to be very cautious when we just look at the angiogram image on its own. So we have all this evidence. We have ways of collecting beautiful pictures. Uh, why aren't we using this more? Well, we can see that the global adoption of uh, physiology around the world remains very low. And we heard a beautiful description of these kind of yes, no camps to either using CT or not, and, and some people obviously very strongly in, in one camp or the other. And I think it's really the same for physiology around the world, whichever modality you use. And I think many of these decisions are not made necessarily always on clinical grounds, they're sometimes made on reimbursement grounds or policy at local institutions. But it's really striking if you look at this global map that you see that on average, the use of these techniques, which we see make a very big difference clinically, are, are so underused around the world. There are, of course, steps to try and improve this, to try and aid adoption. And I'll talk more about one of them tomorrow, the IFR technique. I'll briefly just mention this now. Uh, but others include measuring other uh, modalities using a pressure wire, such as IFR, without the need for giving a drug to make some things simpler and easier, such as measuring just the resting uh, gradient or giving some contrast and seeing what effect that has, or actually moves or afoot to actually using the angiogram to actually calculate the, an FFR value online, so to give more information to the physician. We've heard a little bit about FFRCT, and I'll again cover that in a few slides now. The concept of which, which we developed, IFR, is very similar to FFR, and I'll show you two slides on this. Essentially, it enables the simplification of uh, physiology in the cath lab. So we don't require a drug to be administered. So when you identify significant stenosis, you pass a pressure wire down, then you press a button, and it identifies a phase in the cardiac cycle, this wave-free period, which is in diastole when resistance is low and flow it at its height. So it gives us the most sensitivity. We're very proud to have completed enrolment just prior to Christmas last year for what's going to be the largest physiology study ever conducted. Okay, this is a, a global study, 16 countries, 47 centers, got five centers here in, in Spain. Myself and Javier Escanad from Clinico San Carlos in Madrid are the PIs for this study, alongside uh, Patrick Sorois and Manish Patel in terms of the study chairs. It's essentially a study looking at whether patients would benefit uh, from using either an FFR or IFR guided approach in the patients we see in the cath lab daily. So these are all intermediate lesions, whether it's stable culprit vessels or in the non-culprit vessels in acute coronary syndromes. And we're aiming to report this at TCT this year. Now we've of course seen very low adoption of physiology around the world. And when you see the size of the study, which, which we're building towards now, we hope that this will make a difference. You can see that the physiology arm and defer was only 91, FAME 509, FAME 2, 441. And these two big physiology studies, so the Sweetheart, which is very similar to FLAIR, done by the uh, Swedes as part of the Sweetheart Registry, and FLAIR itself really are kind of game-changing in terms of the size of these studies, which will give us a significantly more weight to use physiology, uh, more to decide how to treat patients effectively in the cath lab. I promised just to share with you a little bit about the CTFFR techniques, and I agree completely with uh, my fellow debater here about, um, about CTFFR. It very, very much is in its infancy. It's a promising technique. But as with many promising techniques, it needs to be proven, and it's very much in its research um, phases. We see claims made that it can show uh, high degrees of uh, match when you compare it to um, FFR. But as with everything in cardiology and medicine in general, a lot of the details often squirreled away uh, with actually looking and understanding the uh, analysis which is being performed. 
And particularly important to this is the patients you take into your study, the distributions you, you, you look at. So, for instance, if you look at this scatter plot, now this is a, a paper which is under review, which essentially is a meta-analysis of all the CTFFR pu publications to date. You can see there's a few striking things here. One, there's a huge amount of patients here which have very, very normal CTFFRs and normal FFR values, and very few which actually have positive values here at all. Now, why this is important, well, apart from you can see on this figure there's quite a wide scatter, but it means if you're doing descriptive statistics here and wanting to work out the accuracy of a technique, well, of course you're going to have a good result because everyone's basically got normal coronary arteries. Yeah. You can see, though, when you start to move down and you start to look, and this is a bland Altman plot comparing that same, same data, essentially, and you look at the difference between the FFR and the CTFFR, you see that actually things can be quite wide, and there's quite a lot of variance here. You can see that the confidence intervals here extend out to an, uh, an FFR of 0.15 or down to 0.21 in terms of the variability for an FFR with a mean of 0.8. Perhaps in post most, most important, a test which I believe should be done on all data sets which claim to alter or to test diagnostic accuracy is to look at the level of agreement at each range of severity. So this is that same data here, but showing how good CTFFR is at each individual uh, data point. So you can see FFRs at the bottom, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So severe lesions, mild lesions. And what you can see is we say, right, we say if the FFR CT is 0.9, how good is it against a measured FFR? So you can see 0.9 gives us an accuracy of about 95%, which most of us agree is very good. As you come down, however, you see when it gets to 0.85, it's about 90%. But perhaps most worrying, the area where we really are most interested, the area where we want to see how good these techniques are, so CT FFR here, between 0.7 and 0.8, it's about 50%. So 50% of the time it agrees with FFR, and 50% of the time it doesn't. You can see, even as the lesions become more significant, and perhaps this may be even more worrying for you, you have a lesion here which is 0.6 or 0.65, it's still only 75% accurate. Now you can easily see how you can make claims of an 80% accuracy agreement, because if you know that it's a 95% agreement if you have lesions which are very mild, all you do is include a load of patients in your study which have very, very mild lesions. And then on average, you have 80 or 90% agreement. This is why this kind of test, this kind of analysis, is much more important to us understanding the actual true accuracy, whether it's CT, CTFFR, FFR, IFR, any of these modalities we look at, because it gives us an idea of, of how we could actually, and, and will be using this in, in real world clinical practice. Now, why this is difficult, and of course, we're looking even with a CT, or an angiogram, we're looking at something which is much more complex on the inside of the artery than, than we think. And perhaps a nice way of looking at this is for this fly through real data, three-dimensional OCT run, which uh, Chris Casira did for, for us at, uh, at Imperial. And you can see in reality that angiogram we see, which is apparently looks relatively smooth, it is far more complex. You can see as you go around the bends, there's undulations, you've got stenosis, you've got branches, and all of these things are absolutely critical uh, in determining uh, the actual physiological uh, pressure loss and whether, uh, the most important question, we should revascularize that patient. So I'm just going to conclude by uh, thanking colleagues. I mentioned Javier uh, Escanad from Clinico San Carlos. I've done a lot of work with Javier in the last five years. He, he's a, a great uh, colleague and friend and uh, contributed a huge amount to the field. There's a huge amount of colleagues uh, at Imperial who I'd obviously like to thank, both within the cardiology and uh, mechanisms of disease section, but also the, the chemical engineering and, and computer section as well. Finally, I'll just show you what we'll be covering tomorrow, and I think that this really is the, the nubbins of where things are moving to and are moving away from just a pure angiographic or even a pure static physiology approach. So rather than knowing is that vessel significant, we really want to be asking the question if we want to revascularize a patient, is where in that vessel is significant and can I target my stents or my grafts more effectively to relieve anginal symptoms? Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for your interesting lecture. It's time to reply. Each speaker has five minutes uh, to reply. The other one. So, uh, Dr. Achenbach, please.
my life easy because he didn't really criticize Cardiac CT at all. Um, but I have to, what he did is was to criticize Invasive Angel for not being very useful without FFR. But I did prepare a few slides as a rebuttal, not so much to convince Dr. Davies, but much more to convince all of you that Cardiac CT is really the future, even if you might not be able to imagine it um, at the moment. Can you bring up the, the additional slides that I brought, please? It's not important that I see something, but it would be really good if, if the audience would see something. Is, is there a certain possibility that we will see the slides? Otherwise, I can simply try to convince everybody without slides. Yeah. Ah, here we go. So, you know, technology is progressing. And if you think that CT angiography might not be useful today and that invasive angiography is much better and invasive angiography is there to stay, it might simply be something that you're not able to imagine at the moment, that things will change. If we look back approximately 40 years, there was a technique which was called pneumoencephalography. It was a technique that was used when there was a suspicion that there might be a tumor in the brain. And what the physicians would do is they would put a big needle in your spine and inflate air into the spine and into the brain and then take an x-ray. It was really a form of torture, putting a big needle in your spine just to find out whether there was a tumor in your brain, which of course these days we do much better and very easily by computer tomography. Now for us it's impossible to even remotely imagine why anybody would want to torture a patient like this just to find out whether there was a tumor in the brain. Now think about today and what people in 20 years will say about us today. Today, if you want to find out whether there are stenosis in the coronary artery, we actually put a big needle into the patient's groin or wrist only to find out whether there might be a narrowing in the coronary arteries, when this can be done so much more easily by computer tomography. So I would easily predict that with the way technology progresses, just like pneumoencephalography for pure diagnostic purposes has disappeared over the past 40 years, in the very same way, invasive angiography for purely diagnostic purposes will disappear in the next 10 or 20 years. It's just something that we're not able to imagine today. And you know, just to point out how increasing and improving technology will change our perspective. Because we really have the ability today to get this sort of image quality, and image quality will get better in the future, there's absolutely no doubt. So we will be able to replace more and more invasive angiograms by non-invasive testing, and we will, and we will all live to see it. So once again, to summarize my points, CT coronary angiography is highly accurate to detect and rule out stenosis. It has very high prognostic value. A normal CT angiography means that the patient's prognosis is normal and no further testing needs to be done. And it is safe to use in the clinical setting as very large 10,000 patient randomized trials and 30,000 patient registries have shown. We just need to make sure that it's performed with up-to-date technology by trained and experienced personnel and not by somebody who does one CT angiogram per month, you know, um, then diagnostic image quality will be really poor and it should be used in the appropriate patients. Thank you very much. Dr. David. Well, of course, I wasn't negative on CT because actually I, I, I believe that CT has got a, a role for all kind of uh, for all of us in terms of as part of our patient pathways. Um, I certainly think that if you want to get beautiful angiogram pictures, CT is is the the way forward. I agree completely that things will continue to develop and um, evolve in the next you know 20 years. And I think things may even develop and evolve you know, beyond what we can think now. I mean, there's already prototyping now which has imaging which doesn't even involve using radiation. So I think that 
think that's going to be another huge step going forward. And whether that's invasive or non-invasive um, going forward, you know, will be seen. But I think that any of these techniques, I think we need to bear in mind two things. When you, when you look at the patients coming in to your uh, CT scanning room or your cath lab for diagnostic procedures, I think when we have easy availability of these tests, one of the problems we do and one of the, the, the things which leads to a lot of very normal tests is we, we're ignoring the questions, perhaps, and some of the basic medicine that our forefathers used to use 20 or 30 years ago in terms of screening patients who truly were likely to have angina or not. It's often easier to put them in the scanner, to give them a diagnostic procedure, and, of course, that's how you get very high levels of unnecessary tests, which are all very normal. Of course, that's, it's good if you want to demonstrate your test as a, as a good screening tool for ruling out patients, but perhaps the long-term effects of radiation exposure over 40 years for a 30-year-old woman in terms of getting breast cancer are, are very real. Um, I think for me, and hopefully I've got across in terms of the talk I gave earlier, I think that the CTFFR is, is premature to be rolled out into clinical practice currently. And I think that we still have one major hurdle. Outside of patients who have very regular and smooth coronary arteries, I think that we still need to be very, very careful about putting a label on arteries, whether they are significant and need treatment or non-significant and don't need treatment from using any form of imaging uh, alone. And, and that would be my kind of one lesson uh, of caution, is that to, for us to make that right diagnostic decision, uh, we need to make sure that we're not just treating uh, an image, we're actually treating uh, something which is likely to improve blood flow and most importantly treating our patients. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good. It's time for, for questions and for comment. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Achenbach. I would like to, to know in, in your clinical practice, in the routine clinical practice, how many patients need an angiography after a CT for the diagnosis of coronary heart disease? The proportion of this patient in, in all commerce in your hospital. I, I am really impressed by your, by your image, but I think this image is not obtained in, in all patients. So. Oh, now you can hear me. The rate of uh, patients where we do CT and are unable to rule out coronary stenosis is approximately 15 to 20 percent. So in about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of those who come to have a CT angiogram, we can send them home and say they need for no further testing. But perhaps remember, I think that that, that value is very dependent on your population. So for instance, if we, and I'm sure you, you may agree, that in where we are in London, we have a very large Bangladeshi and Indian po po patient population who have very small calcified coronary arteries. So we may, we may not get up to that, that high level of sending those patients home, as you may get in a very Caucasian, yeah, large artery German population. And it, it depends very much on the pretest likelihood of the patients that you scan. We do not perform CT angiography in patients who have a very positive stress MR and typical symptoms. And these are candidates for the cath lab. We perform it in those who have a relatively low pretest likelihood. The rate of patients where we cannot rule out stenosis because image quality is poor is extremely low. It's about 5%. 4%. But that's, of course, we are because of the large body of expertise that we have. So we have good equipment and we know what to do. And it really should be concentrated in centers who have good experience with the technique to avoid the typical sequence. Somebody who never read, needed any test, really, because there were no symptoms, but the patients just wanted to know, has a CT angiogram. Then the CT angiogram is non-diagnostic. And somebody says, mm, I'm not so sure about the proximal right coronary artery. I think we should do an invasive angiogram. And then an invasive angiogram is done that was never needed in the first place. And that's what we really have to avoid. Okay. Uh, any question from the audience? Any comment? Gemma? <laughs> okay. Francisco? So if no question from the audience, I have just one. Uh, maybe address it to uh, Professor Achenbach. Uh, do you think, uh, um, you haven't uh, talked about um, black morphology, maybe would be interested in the yes. in future. And do you think maybe uh, the right moment to perform um, clinical trial with a, a, 
C2E scan driven strategy versus an inv early invasive strategy in non ST elevation acute myocardial infarction? Yes, I mean, these are, these are perfect um, questions. Number one is uh, something that I did not talk about was the fact that CT can not only show and rule out stenosis, but CT can also show plaque calcified and non-calcified plaque, and what do we do with these patients? And there's really no good um, studies that tell us that we should put patients who have plaque in CT angiography on risk modification therapy. There's very good data that individuals who have no plaque do not benefit to the least extent from aspirin or statins. So it's safe to withhold statin therapy and aspirin in individuals who have risk factors but no plaque in CT angiography. This has been shown very nicely in very large registries. If you have no plaque, you do not benefit from a statin. But there's not the opposite saying that if you find plaque, you have to put patients on a statin. This is still an individual decision that CT can, at the moment, not really give you a very clear answer on. The second question was studies in non-ST elevation acute coronary syndromes. There are studies in acute chest pain patients. The um, PROSPECT trial, for example, approximately 1,000 patients that show that if you come with acute chest pain, you have no troponins. CT can rule out coronary stenosis. But I completely agree with you that we need a study in patients who have troponin, the troponin of 2 and troponin of 4, um, the low troponin ranges, whether CT can replace invasive workup in these patients. These trials should be done, but they are not at the moment present. Thank you. Okay. Any, any other question? So we can finish the decision. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to the speakers. Uh, enjoy the meeting. Enjoy Malaga. Uh, bye. Thank you very much.